I can have your attention, please. We're about to begin the services for Dr. Manuel Silverman. Just as a gentle reminder for those of you present here at the chapel, if you have a cell phone with you, please place it in the silent mode or turn it off completely. That would be appreciated. The service this morning will be conducted by Rabbi Amanda Green from the Chicago Sinai Congregation. Death has taken our beloved Manuel Silverman. Our friends grieve in their now darkened world. In their silence, there's lamentation. In their tears, there's loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O oh God. Be with them. For Manny's love that united us in life and which death cannot sever. For his companionship that we shared along life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of his heart and his mind that brought us joy and happiness and is now a precious remembrance for all these and more we give our thanks to God. In this time of grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures that brings us the ever new message of God's nearness. It tells us of our kinship with the creator in light as in darkness, in joy as in sorrow, in life as in death. I invite you to open the pamphlet and join me in the words of the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm has been used for centuries and generations to bring comfort to the mourners. Please join with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Birth is a beginning, and death a destination. But life is a journey from childhood to maturity, and youth to age, from innocence to awareness, and ignorance to knowing from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness and back, we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning, and death a destination, but life is a journey a sacred pilgrimage to life everlasting. Indeed, Manny's life was a journey from stage to stage of going and growings, of sorrows and of joys. Manuel Silverman was born in April of 1940 in South Bend, Indiana, to his parents Maurice and Sophie Fishman. 
Tragically, only two months following his birth, his father passed away. It was a moment that left a big imprint on his heart and led to a life of both highs and lows, of great successes and great challenges. Though Manny and his mom moved in with his grandparents, the void of the father figure was strong. Years later, when Manny was around nine or 10 years old, his mother remarried Manny Silverman, who legally adopted him and his son and became Manny Silverman. Manny was an only child, but he had lots of cousins and was close with his uncle Milt and Aunt Bonnie. He attended John Adams High School where he met his lifelong friends, Fred Kahn, Irv Rosenberg, and Jerry Poling. After high school, Manny attended Indiana University's School of Education. It was while he was at IU that he met his first wife, Sharon. Following graduation, Manny and Sharon moved to Michigan City where Manny taught high school English. He was a smart man. And after being awarded a grant from Purdue to get his master's, he then was accepted to the Northwestern School of Psychology, which brought Manny and Sharon here to Chicago, where they moved to Evanston and where Manny received his PhD and worked as a professor of psychology in the School of Education at Loyola while also having his own practice. In Evanston, Josh was born, and shortly after, the family relocated to Wilmette, where Josh and Dan grew up. As a father, Manny had a big presence. He was loving and caring, supportive, and a big family man. It didn't matter if you were blood-related or part of an ex's family, family was family. When Tracy and Alma entered the family, he welcomed them as if you were his own children showering you with gifts and flowers, and those four grandchildren. He was grandpa to Max and to Miles, and Lolo to Trisha and Oliver. Oh, how your grandfather adored you. Manny had a special relationship with his niece, Becca, and his nephew, Ryan, as well. So it is only fitting that we begin by hearing from those who knew Manny best. We will first hear from Josh and then Sharon, and then his friend Ken Moses, followed by Max and Miles, who will share words on behalf of the grandchildren. Josh. Thank you, Rabbi Green. It's so nice to see everybody here to celebrate my father. Searching. We are all searching for meaning. We all search for acceptance. It is okay, and that is part of our lifelong journey. My dad knew that as well as anyone. Excuse me while I address two important individuals here that are very special to my dad and me as we are connected in only way that a father and their children can know. Max, Grandpa loved you very much. He has helped me to understand your search. Uh, I may not get it right all the time, but I am here and you need to know that Grandpa has helped me my whole life understand you as my child and to celebrate your individuality. Miles, Grandpa was so proud of you. Your love of hockey and sailing and all things active brought joy to him. He loved you very much. I know he enjoyed seeing how happy you are when you are participating in the things that you love to do. He wants both both of you, along with everyone here today, to keep searching. Searching for meaning and acceptance in your life, that is his legacy. In every way, my dad Manny was searching, searching for the meaning in a life that he not already would know being meaningful to himself, and yet also so meaningful to others as well. 
His big heart was a blanket that enveloped all that came into its fold throughout his entire life. A caring soul. That was my dad, Manny. The outpouring of love and affection that he bestowed upon all that knew him developed out of the ultimate desire for him to be loved himself. As Rabbi Green said, Dad was born April 15th, 1940. In June of that same year, he lost his father. Thus, he never experienced that special bond of a father and son relationship from a son's perspective. Until maybe later, as he was adopted by Sophie's second husband, Manny. However, I believe that this absence of a paternal father that allowed Manny to yearn for belonging and eventually contribute to an angst that would later cause him a lifetime of struggle. His ability to overcome that struggle amazes me to this day and allows me to see that as we ourselves embrace our own struggles, we too can reach a place of peace. Now, if you struggle to decide what to wear today, Manny could have been of some assistance. He loved clothes and would have taken you shopping to find the perfect outfit. He was a clothes horse and would always be a fashion statement. Sometimes the fashion choices he worked and others, uh, not so much. He definitely had his own unique style. Caring soul. It's the most general definition that describes my dad for all who met him. However, he also earns the title of RGD, really good dad. He showed Dan and me kindness and compassion and allowed us the freedom to explore our own paths. His patience made him a great teacher. He took pride in teaching me and Dan how to ski. That provided many years of joy to him and our family, along with the Schoenfelds, the Lubuchecks, and many others. There are many of you here today that joined us on many ski trips past and present. We all owe gratitude to my dad for instilling us a love of the sport. Many trips stand out and are engraved in my memory. Aspen, Park City, Boyne, and others. Once there was a ski trip where all of the children were allowed to sit at their own table in the restaurant while my parents and the other parents enjoyed their own private table. Dan, myself, and Ken Schoenfeld, along with Jerry, Ronnie, and Amy Lubachuk were so rambunctious that the patrons of the restaurant told our parents that those children should never be allowed in public. I believe my dad's response was something to the effect, those aren't my children. Aspen, Park City, and Boyne. They associate Manny with skiing. Sunfish, O'Day, Siren, and Arrow. They associate my dad with sailing. Sunfish, O'Day, Siren, Arrow, and eventually Nepenthe, a white Pearson 26 with a light blue deck. All boats my dad had owned. Sailing was his ultimate passion. How fitting that his last boat was named Nepenthe, a fictional drug first appearing in the fourth book of Homer's Odyssey. Then Helen, daughter of Zeus, took other counsel. Straight away, she cast into the wine of which they were drinking a drug to quiet all pain and strife and bring forgetfulness of every ill. My dad's interpretation, a redeemer of all sorrows. The Pearson was his sorrow redeemer. On any given summer day, you would find my dad on his boat at Wilmot Harbor. I did not always understand him. In many instances, I found his behavior embarrassing. But he had a clear understanding of how to be a dad, even though that example was absent most of his childhood. His embarrassing moments were only embarrassing to me and sometimes others. For him, they were how he navigated the space he occupied. We all have experienced embarrassment from some of our parents at one point or another. It is part of childhood. I used to shrug off his embarrassing acts and worry they reflected poorly on me in some way. Later, 
In my adult life, I have come to realize those acts of embarrassment have allowed me to become more compassionate and more understanding of other people's faults. My own sense of embarrassment around a harmless act of Manny's doing ignited a sensitivity that allows me to be more genuine and caring. I thank him for being who he is. His acts of being showed me the way to become a good father. Dan and I were so fortunate to have total access to our father throughout our childhood, especially during holidays in the summer months. The benefits of a teaching schedule meant that he was present for us. To this day, he still amazed me with his ability to be my dad. As he was only being himself, he did not realize that he had shown Dan and me how to be good dads ourselves. I recall not too long ago when I was searching for a way to bring a more enriching Jewish experience to both of my children, Max and Miles. I registered for the Father-Son Kalah weekend at Owen Sang Ruby in Wisconsin. I invited Dad, and he excitedly accepted my invitation. Max, Miles, Manny, and I were headed to Father-Son weekend camp in November. There, after the kids went to bed, the other fathers gathered round and discussed how we viewed fatherhood and how Judaism shaped our lives. As my dad was observing this conversation of fathers sharing their thoughts on being good fathers and instilling good values in their children, he turned to me and asked something like, where did I learn to raise my children through a compassionate lens with the values of the Jewish faith? He was somewhat unaware that it was mostly his modeling of caring and compassion that showed me the way to become a good dad. His partition, participation in temple life at Am Shalom provided the foundation for a rich Jewish experience. He showed me the importance of giving and being connected to a community of Jews. The values of the Jewish faith were his identity, even though later on in life he became a practicing Buddhist. His study of Buddhism and meditation happened after I was an adult. There are some voids in my own connection to him as a Buddhist. Again, he was still searching and I was busy raising my family. Though we never lost touch, I struggled to understand my dad's path away from Judaism and towards Buddhism. Over the last three years, I became his caregiver and it became clear that his Judaism never left him. He just needed to find an additional path to be a peaceful existence that included a rich, wonderful embracement of Buddhism. Buddhism. Searching is where I began this address today, and that is where Manny started life. Searching for a father, searching for a family, searching for meaning. His lifelong search for all of those things has found him in a room rich with fathers who are good dads because of him, in a room rich with friends that are part of his family that love and care for him, rich with meaning. So much meaning that we ourselves are also still searching to find the right balance in our own lives because we have seen through Manny what facing struggle head on can do to improve our own mental health and well being. We are all better for knowing my dad. Whether you knew him his whole life or you just learned about him today, his spirit of compassion is living within you from this day forth. I love you, Dad. Your living presence is missed dearly, but your big heart lives on with all of us. May your life truly be a blessing for all who crossed your path. Bye. Well, it was 60 years ago when Manny and I met and had a golfing date in college. <clears throat> he stood a little close to me 
And on the upswing of my club, I knocked him out right on the floor. <laughs> Blood spewing everywhere. A quick trip to the <clears throat> hospital in Bloomington, Indiana. And thank goodness he was OK. <clears throat> and then later, he called me for another date, <laughs> but not for golf. <clears throat> I tell this story because it is so Manny. Fun-loving and forgiving. Through happy and sad times, we remained friends until his final days. Our children and grandchildren exemplify his values of kindness, curiosity, and tikkun olam, repairing the world. He was all about tikkun olam. There is no greater legacy than this. But most of all, I remember Manny for his devotion to our family, his love of life, his empathy, and his compassion and care for others. I'm so fortunate to have known him and will dearly miss him for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm Ken Moses and have been a friend of Manny's for over 40 years. I have been working on writing what to say for now cumulatively at least five hours. I kept rewriting it. It's not done. And I thought, What is this about? My friend Manny is without a doubt the most unusual person I have ever met. An enigma in ways that you cannot imagine, paradoxical in ways that are unbelievable, looking for a particular word that would speak to how many hits you, I came up with oxymoron. <laughs> how many was externally and who he was truly internally had almost no overlap except one thing that has already been said a number of times, but cannot be said more. Manny was absolutely, unconditionally accepting, caring, loving, positive, optimistic, and forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. And I say that three times because he had suffered so many assaults, so many losses, so much cruelty at different times because people couldn't understand him. He loved so much in life. He loved food cooking it and eating it, but if he couldn't cook it, it didn't matter. <laughs> he loved music. He loved art. He read all kinds of things. He loved theater. He loved film. He loved skiing. He loved sailing. He was an incredible dancer. He was, a, even in that, some kind of a paradox. You never knew the way he looked, what he could do with that body. 
beautiful, stunning, unbelievable. But ultimately, what he loved more than anything in the world was not just family, but he expanded family to humanity. Every person he met, no matter what their ilk, what their, their status, what their issues, whatever else, he endeavored to engage and he succeeded with so few. Why? Because he had qualities that put people off. He had a sense of humor that could border on the inappropriate so often you cannot believe it. <laughs> My daughter calls him or called him this morning in a text she sent saying that she regretted she couldn't come to the funeral that she wished him well on his journey and she remembers him as unforgivingly goofy. <laughs> and indeed he was. And yet he was amongst the most brilliant, innovative, caring, effective psychotherapists I've known and I've known many. He and I met when I first joined the, or was inducted into the American Academy of Psychotherapists in 19, early 1980s. 40 years we've been friends. But a particular event occurred that I want to share that highlights the paradox, the oxymoron of Manny. One of the things the Academy did, which was a very foolish thing, is they formed these things called family groups. What this was, think about it for a moment. Just don't think about it too hard or too long. A group of psychotherapists who think they are above most other psychotherapists because they've gotten into this academy, get together in a leaderless family group with no goal, no function, and no purpose except somehow to enhance things in a group psychotherapy dynamic. Are you scared yet? <laughs> Should be. It was awful. Awful. And I was a newbie. And I think Manny was a year ahead of me in joining the academy. So we're sitting in this group, and the group would meet separately sometimes, even though it was from around the country. People would gather someplace for five days and run this bloody group for five days, or whatever else, and it was awful. There were evil, truly evil, hidden agendas, getting worked out, people fighting for leadership, people doing whatever else, all the junk that was going on. So towards the end of the group, this particular one, in this first year of my being in a group like this, after a coffee break, Manny goes into the room before anyone else. Now, every, remember, you're doing the group in five days. Everybody sat in the same chair. Manny walked in and sat down in somebody else's chair before anybody else came in. Now they come in, and he happened to sit in a particular woman's chair, and she said, Manny, that's my chair. He says, no, it's, it's a chair. 
and I'm sitting in it, so right now it's my chair. <laughs> and you could feel a tension start to come up in the room, a real tension. And now this becomes the subject of discussion. Everybody comes in, she a little disgruntled, sits now in somebody else's chair, and that's gonna force somebody else to move someplace else, and everybody else is now losing their chair, and whatever else. And there was someone who, even though this is a leaderless group, thought himself and behaved as though he were the leader, and he had not such nice intent and was extremely manipulative in terms of forcing people out of the group and inviting people into the group without consulting the rest of the group, creating lots of tension. He now starts to go after Manny. He says, why are you doing this? What, do you need attention? What are you, some kind of baby? I need attention, I need attention, I'm gonna sit in somebody else's seat? The hell is the matter with you? I mean, got nastily confrontational, and believe me, a lot worse than what I'm putting forward. And Manny held, him, held his own and answered literally the question, why? Why are you sitting in so-and-so's seat? And he said, well, I'm feeling that this group is really stuck and I am really stuck in this group. This is going nowhere. So I figured maybe I need a different vantage point. Only Manny could say that with an innocence that you knew he absolutely believed what he was saying, that he wanted a different vantage point. He said, and I decided I wanted to see this group like she does meaning the woman whose seat he took. So, as you can imagine, all hell broke loose. And as all hell broke loose, others started to talk about how log jammed they felt in the group. Others started to feel how frightened they were to talk about something and <laughs> admonished, particularly by this ersatz leader. When I say all hell broke loose, actually all heaven started to open up. And people started to be honest and courageous and start to really, really, really talk. It was amazing, stunning, brilliant, and I believe totally natural and unconscious on Manny's part. It was who he was. It was not a technique, it was not a method, it wasn't something he thought out, it just was who he was. Who he was as a therapist, who he was as a university professor and teacher. And the more traditional people or the people with other kinds of motives and whatever else, couldn't stand it. It made them uncomfortable. It flushed out their dishonesty. It flushed out their lack of being able to go inside and really own their own humanity and who they were. Manny faced his demons. Manny, therefore, became like a carrier of somebody who could help anybody who encountered him face their demons. And when they came out and they were shared with him, he was nothing but universally compassionate, empathic, forgiving, warm, loving, and the most wonderful, unforgiving goofball. I have ever met in my life. I 
will never forget him. And he gave me one more privilege that was astonishing. He let me be with him as he died. I don't know if I was the last friend or family, but I was pretty close, who saw Manny the day or two before he died. And I saw him before, in the visit before, he invited me in. He could barely speak, didn't say much, but I asked him, Manny, are you in pain? He said, no. I said, anything you need? He said, no. This is the visit before, the second one. I said, do you need anything? thought for a moment. He said, no. By the way, he would doze off for a minute or two in between each interaction. He had almost no energy. Almost no energy. And then the next time he came out, I said, Manny, do you have any unfinished business? He hesitated. And he said, no. I said, you seem at peace. He said, I am. I am. Then he dozed off again. And when he came back out, he said, I'm ready to go. lasted a couple more weeks and then when I saw him this last time I asked him again if he was in pain what he needed and what he didn't all things were no he wasn't speaking anymore he was nodding or shaking his head I said do you need anything he said and I saw he was licking his lips I said are you thirsty he said Got him water, he drank water. His aide gave it to him. And then, <clears throat> I said, are you confused? Because he had a look on his face. He nodded yes. And I said, oh. I felt he was already halfway there. I said, there's nothing to fear. You're loved. You've done all you need to do. It's okay, and you're safe. Those are my last words. He died the next day, the next day. That is a privilege that he would let me in that way. With that, I found that to be just the epitome of who Manny was when he lived and how he died. I will miss him the rest of my life, but he's with me the rest of my life. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you all for oh, thank you all for coming. Um, I know most of you in the room, but some people are unfamiliar because I know my grandpa touched so many people in his life before even I was here. Um, so if you don't know me, um, I'm Max, and this is Miles, and we are Josh's kids. 
Um, <laughs> I first wanted to um, speak on behalf of Trisha and Oliver, um, uh, Manny's two other grandkids. Um, they unfortunately can't be here right now because they are in the Philippines, um, but they wrote a letter for me to read out to everyone. So, to our dearest Lolo, we can't even express how heartbroken we are right now. Even if we searched the entire universe, we are sure that we will never find a grandpa who is as loving and caring as you were to us. You were such an amazing grandfather to all of us. Oliver and I weren't ready for you to go. We weren't prepared for you to leave. Our heart hurts so much. Our hearts are so heavy. We will never erase you in our mind, and we promise to hold you in our heart till the day we meet again in heaven. It will never be the same without you, but we find peace knowing now that you are free from all the pain and suffering. Thank you for accepting me and Oliver. Thank you for loving us as your own grandchildren. We love you. I love you. Always and forever. Rest well now, Lolo. To Dad, Uncle Josh, Grandma, David, Mom, Tracy, Max, and Miles, we are so sorry. We weren't there to hug all of you. We are sorry for not being able to attend. Our heart aches knowing that we can't be to, there to support you during this difficult time, sending hugs and kisses to all. Love, Trisha and Oliver. Um, I also struggled with what to say today. Um, and I think really that's because you can't put into words the way that my grandpa made you feel. Um, I think he was truly an experience of a person. Um, he, as many people mentioned, was so generous. Um, he always had gifts, and actually this shirt I'm wearing right now um, came from one of his more recent eBay endeavors. <laughs> if you are familiar with those <laughs> over the past few years. Um, so just really quick, I wanted to say to Grandpa, the silliest, goofiest guy I know, thank you for sharing with us the greatest gift of all, your contagious smile and laughter. But if you know him, you know that it was more of that weird like side tongue goofy face he made, followed by sort of a squawky chuckle. Um, <laughs> but I just think that makes it all the more contagious. You were and are a true light for so many. And may your joy continue to radiate on in ways that we can only begin to imagine. Rest easy. Um, Grandpa, you affected me in the best of ways with your humor and your love and everything you've given to me and your love towards people and animals in your many pets i've never known you to not have a pet and now we are stuck with your cat <laughs> <laughs> in the best ways possible um and now whenever a sailor passes you ring eight bells to love to show them love and remembrance and to tie in with his Buddhism, we're going to ring his Buddhist meditation bell eight times. You, Josh and Sharon and Ken, Max and Trisha and Oliver and Miles for sharing your memories with us, for helping us to get to know <clears throat> your father and grandfather and your friend. Manny was a character. 
He was known to have that great sense of humor and love to tell jokes, albeit, as Ken said, not always the most appropriate ones. Nonetheless, they made for some great family memories and inside jokes. Manny loved the arts and culture. He loved the opera, and he enjoyed reading. He loved talking to people and getting to know their stories. He loved food and introducing others to new foods. He was cur so curious about other cultures that he didn't want to just learn about them. He wanted to be a part of them. Perhaps that's what led him to his interest in Buddhism. Manny Silverman, as you've heard, had a big heart. Whether you were his patient or his oldest childhood friend, Manny cared deeply. Dan recalled the other day a memory of his father taking him to a funeral of one of his patients from a substance abuse, abuse group that he facilitated. Josh remembered how Manny always brought bagels or donuts when he was leading a group, and how one time he decided to bring lox bread to share with a group of people whom lox was quite foreign. Manny not only cared about his patients, they cared about him too. While living at the Brookdale, Manny found himself in an elevator with a woman who had a guide dog. Manny struck up a conversation, and instantly this woman who could not see replied, Manny Silverman? All those years later, she recognized him simply by the sound of his voice. Manny had friends from his work and from the network of psychologists that he knew through AAP, in particular Ken Moses, who spoke a few moments ago, who was by his side until the very end. There were friends Manny met later in life, too, that he made in the cigar shops, both at Uptown Tobacco and at Irwin Reese. When he lost the ability to do many of the things that brought him joy, he turned to create new friendships. But most of all, Manny was a family man, a loving and devoted father to Josh and Dan, father-in-law to Tracy and Alma, proud grandpa to Max and Miles, and Lolo to Trisha and Oliver. As a family man, everyone was included, and despite their divorce, Manny and Sharon maintained a lifelong friendship as well as maintaining their family unit of four carrying the Silverman legacy. There are so many great memories that you share of Manny, the father and grandfather. How he never walked into your home without a bag full of gifts. He loved a good deal, and he loved to shower you all with gifts, and sometimes even regifted what he had. Not because he needed to regift something, but because he wanted you to have a part of him. If you compliment, complimented the hat he was wearing, he took it off his head and he gave it to you. He wanted you to have it. He wanted everyone to have a piece of him. Perhaps Manny's love for skiing and sailing that we've all heard about describe him best. How he introduced Josh and Dan to lifelong sports that they could share as a family and that they could pass down to the next generation. As a family, your ski trips with other families created wonderful memories, whether in Wilmette Mountain or Michigan or Colorado or Manny's favorite, Park City. And sailing, too. The boat at Wilmette Harbor for many years, always inviting friends to join them. Skiing or sailing, the Silverman family created a lifetime of memories. Manny's life wasn't a straight path of positive and uplifting memories. The struggle that began his life came and went as Manny journeyed through his life. How lucky he was to have you by his side through it all. I know how grateful he must have been to Sharon and to Dan and Alma and Josh, to you and Tracy, who devoted hours of love and support to care for Manny and to honor him until the very end. For a man who had the biggest heart, I hope that a piece of it will remain inside each of you. I know that the next time that you are out on a boat or on a mountaintop, Manny's presence will be with you. And each time you tell a funny joke, share your generosity with others, and every day that you remain committed to loving each other as a family, you will indeed carry on Manny Silverman's legacy. May Manny's legacy be for a blessing. If you are able, I invite you now to rise as we turn to the El Malay Rahamim prayer. The English can be found on your packet, on the back side of your packet. El Malay Rahamim, Shochin Bam Romim, 
ham tsemenu khanna khona takhat kan fe hashkhina im kedoshim utoho rim kezohar harakia mazhi rim et nishmat emmanuel shahalakh le olamo al harahamim yasti rehu beseter kana favle olamim fits roar bits roar hakhayim et nishmato adonai huna khalato beyanuakh beshalom al mish kavo venomar amen God of abundant mercy, God most high, may the soul of our loved one who has gone into eternity find the gift of perfect peace under your embrace, together with the holy and pure, whose light shines like the radiance of heaven. Compassionate God, hold Manny close to you forever so that his soul may be bound up in the bond of life eternal. May Manny find a home with you, and may he rest in peace. Together, we say, amen. We'll also join together now in words of Kaddish, which can also be found in your packet. Kaddish prayer is meant to offer support and comfort to the mourners. It is one of few prayers in our Jewish tradition that requires a group of 10 individuals to be present, simply because no one should have to walk the path of grief alone. Josh and Tracy, Miles and Max, Becca and Alma, and Dan and Sharon and Dan and Esty. Behind you are dozens of people. And later they will fill your home. And in the days and the weeks to come, they will be there to support you. And for now, we all join together to support you in saying Kaddish for the first time for your father and grandfather and friend. It gadal vi it kadash shame raba, be alma de vera hirute viam lich malhute, be hayahon, viomehon, uvahaye, the whole bait Yisrael, Bagalau vizman kari vim ru, amen. Yehe shame raba, mevarach le alam, while me almaya. It barach vi ish tabach vi it paar vi it romam vi it nasse. Viet Hadar, Viet Ale, Viet Alal, Shumid Gudisha, Brihu. Le Ela mean Kol Birhata, Vishir Atta. Tush Behata, Venahemata. Dami Rambe Alma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba, Min Shamaya. Vehaim Alenu, Be Al Kol Yisrael. Vimru, Amen. O se Shalom, Bemromav. Hu ya a se Shalom. Alenu, Be Al Kol Yisrael. Be'imru, amen. May the source of peace send peace to all who mourn and comfort all who are bereaved as we say together, amen. You may be seated. Actually. The Shiva will be observed at the Silverman residence 2932 West Eastwood Avenue in Chicago, immediately following the service this, this afternoon until 5 p.m. today. And there is street parking available in the area there. And just a reminder that uh, attendees need to be vaccinated and also wear masks. The following family members and friends have been selected to serve as pallbearers. As I call your name, you please step forward to escort Dr. Silverman's casket from the chapel. Miles Silverman, Tracy Silverman, Alma Silverman, Dave Zimbaroff, Becca Hughes, Howard Dacoff, Chuck Neville, and Ken Moses. At this time, I'll ask everyone to please rise as we escort the casket from the chapel. <laughs> 